So we are excited to have painter, master, and author Carlin Betcha with us here today. She's an award-winning illustrator, and she's received grand prizes from both the Society of Children's Writers and Illustrators and the Society of Illustrators. So um, it's very exciting to have someone uh, that has so much talent. She's also recently authored Digital Painting for the Complete Beginner, so I encourage you to check that out. And Carlin will pull up the, um, the web page at the end here so that you can see where you can go and purchase that. And she's been using Painter for over 10 years, or digital painting for 10 years. So she has a lot of experience to share with you. And when she told me about all the topics she's looking to cover, I was just wondering how she's going to fit them all in. So we'll go ahead at this point in time, and I'll turn it over to you, Carlin, to show us everything you've got. OK. Thank you, Tanya, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining me today. Uh, please let Tanya know if you can't hear me at all, but uh, so far it sounds good. I am going to be starting at sort of an unlikely place. I looked over all the submissions as far as what everyone was looking for to learn in this webinar. And I was surprised by how many varied responses there was. Um, it seems like everyone has coming from different backgrounds. Some of you have never used Painter. Some of you have been using it longer than I have. And some of you are somewhere in between. So I'm going to start actually in sort of the unsung hero of Painter, and that's in the patterns palette. And the reason why I'm going to start there is it's one of the things that's probably better demoed than to reading a book. It, uh, it's very different in Painter 12. So if you're on Painter 11, this is going to look very different to you. you uh, all the Painter 11 folks are probably going to be more familiar with the pattern mover, which is completely gone in Painter 12. Um, I think we can all agree that the pattern mover was a little bit sadistic, but it is all cleaned up now, and everything is a lot simpler. So I'm starting Carlin? with just basically a 5 by 7 Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm getting a couple responses here saying that the sound is too low. I don't know if you oh, can this. The sound is too low. OK, let me try speaking into my microphone a little. I'll that sounds, it sounds good to me. I do have the sound all the way up. Yeah, okay. I have it all the way up. Ask them if that's better. It, it does sound better to me, so let's see. OK. I probably, I sometimes gesticulate when I am presenting, and I, I do it even if I'm alone. So I was probably in the moment uh, moving my head away from the microphone. OK, so I'm, thank you. I am crouched down, and I am closer to my mic now. Everyone says it's better. Thanks. OK, good. No more wild gesticulations for me. I am starting with a new image at about 300 dpi and 5 by 7 just for demonstration purposes. I'm going to move this where I can see it and it's closer to my microphone. For those of you who are new to Painter, this is the property bar. This is where you will pick all your brushes, and this is the recent brushes. So I'm going to start with a, a tool I usually start with, and that's the grainy variable pencil. There are a lot of tools that you need to customize to some degree to your needs. The grainy variable pencil really behaves exactly how it sounds. It acts like a grainy variable pencil. I prefer a paper with a little bit of tooth to it. You can control the grain up here, and 40% seems to work pretty well for me. Remember that anytime you see the word grain in the property bar, that it's going to pick up the texture of your paper. So I'm going to pick, uh, oh, let's see, no, not a basic paper. Let's pick um, artist rough paper, because I do want a rough texture. And I'm going to start with a, let's say, a grayish brown color. Next, I'm going to turn on mirror painting, because for this process, we're going to do something, a very simplistic illustration. Actually, I want it a little bit grayer. Mirror painting will bring, well, anytime you select, just like Photoshop, anytime you select any of the tools in the toolbar, your property bar right here will change. Mirror painting, you have the option to create a horizontal plane and a vertical plane. Mirror painting will basically draw exactly what you want from left to right. So just scribbling, blah, 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 blah. Uh, that is mirroring both the top and to bottom and the left to right. 
but I actually don't want that. I want just left to right. So uh, this is the toggle mirror painting. If I want to turn it off, it's right there. I'm going to draw a very simple shape with my variable pencil. And this will be perfect for a hot day like today. That's a hanger, or at least it's going to be a hanger. This is the point where I'd ask everyone if they can guess what I'm drawing. I always get some very interesting responses halfway through a drawing. So with mirror painting, I'm flipping over my pencils to use my eraser tool. In fact, so that everyone can see what I'm doing, I will use it over here. And I'll erase right there. And I'll erase right there. And I'm waiting for some people to respond in the question panel saying their response as to what you're drawing here. Oh, OK. Um, you can feel free to ask questions as we go. I'm, as a mother of two, I'm used to multitasking. And you'll, you'll have to remind me if my head starts to get away from the microphone. Okay. So I've, I've drawn just a very simple pattern. I'm now going to turn off mirror painting. Um, if you wanted, if this line is distracting to you, you can change the color from your color palette. You can also toggle it off. When you toggle it off, it's just toggling the visibility. If you can see, it's still mirror painting. It's still on. In fact, oftentimes I've forgotten that I have mirror painting on, so I like to try to keep that on. So I'm going to toggle it off because I need a little hanger and I don't want it to repeat left to right. So everyone is guessing a little dress, dress on a hanger, a dress. Yeah, it's a little dress. It's going to be a dress. I initially thought you were doing some sort of angel. No. no it looks no like angel. angel wings. Oh, by the way, I use a Wacom uh, Cintiq. Say one more. Cares. Uh, there's a little bit of a dial on the side, and that helps me control my brush size. So I'm just going to clean this up now that I have a very simple drawing. Oops. Don't want that. Okay. So we're going to embrace the roughness of this, too, in this simple drawing, because we're going to be putting patterns over it. And this will give you a rough idea of what I'm doing. I'm going to turn mirror painting back on, because it speeds things up. And I'm going to switch to the wash brush. The wash brush is found under digital watercolors. And let me open up a new palette so I can just show you what the brush does. I call this the forgiving watercolors. And I say it's forgiving because unlike other watercolors, let's pick like a pink color. I'm making my brush really big so you can see it. The wash brush, as you lay down color, I'm picking up my pen now. Now in typical watercolors, if I lay back my pen, it will build up color on top of it. The wash brush doesn't work like that. It makes a continuous wash of color. But as you can see, I have this sort of pooling at the edge. In order to get that, you do need to mess a little bit around with these settings. If I can put the diffusion all the way up to 20, the diffusion will feather this, the edges. Wet fringe is how much the paint pools at the edges, sort of if you're used to working wet on wet. So if I change my brush to these settings, which I think might even be the default settings for this brush, you can see it has a very different look than if I turn the wet fringe up to 100 and the diffusion all the way down to zero. You get a little bit more of that pooling at the side. And it looks a little bit more watercolors to me. If you're a diehard watercolors, I recommend playing around with the real wash, re real watercolors. And those I call the hardcore watercolor brushes because they behave more like watercolors. These are sort of the pretend watercolors. Okay, so I'm going to create a new layer. And let's see what color should we make this dress. I'm kind of sick of pink. Let's make it blue. And I'm just making a continuous wash of color. This is great for cell painting. Uh, if you're doing any sort of simple you know, cartoon type work, because of its ability to lie, lay down color, 
still, you still get that pooling at the edge, but you can lift up your brush, which is really important to me because, uh, especially with this sort of cell painting. And then we'll make the top, uh, actually, I don't like that color. So whenever you put down a color and you don't like it, change it. I went to Effects, Tonal Control, Adjust Color. And I'm going to shift the hue of that. Oh, I need it. I have it set to gel. I can't change it right now. I'll change it later. Never mind. Okay, we will change that later. Though um, I'm going to pick a uh, let's pick a darker blue color. Carlin, do you yeah. work with the default user interface, or do you ever um, do you have custom workspaces that you've created? Yes, I have. My custom workspace is really whacked oil painting, mad woman painting, <laughs> and oil painting for when I'm just, you know, messing around. Um, I, since I do mostly oil painting, those are the spaces I usually work with. Let's try green. That's kind of like bright and obnoxious. Actually, I'm going to make it on the same layer to cover up those little dots. Oh, I'm going to undo that. Maybe there. Now, when I work with watercolors, I, I tend to use multiple layers. I don't with oil painting. I work on one uh, continuous layer over and over again. Um, and you'll find that you do the same with oil painting. It, it's really weird because with, uh, with, if you come from a background of traditional painting, you'll find that the brushes that you like the most are the ones that you're drawn with in painter, too. Um, I've never really cared that much for watercolors, so they're not my usual go-to brushes. But for this example, I really do need like a simple wash of color so that the patterns will stand out on them in the next step. So there we go, our simple little, we'll add a little bit of trim to her. Uh, turn back on your painting. Carlin, could you zoom in just a little bit so that we can see a little more of the detail? Sure. Well, there's really not a lot of detail to it. It's a very simple, uh, you could say the roughness of it gives it a charm. <laughs> but yeah, it's a very, very simple drawing, but I will try to zoom in. Let me make this bigger. Thank you. Okay, so we have a very simple drawing. My, my daughter probably could have done the same thing. I'm going to turn mirror painting off, and now we are going to move on to patterns. I'm going to create a new layer, and I'm going to name it. The layer palette is very similar to Photoshop. If this is new to you, um, it's very intuitive. Once you start playing around with it, I double-clicked on it to change that to pattern. New layer is down here. Uh, you can also add new layer through this little icon right here. Uh, so it's fairly simple. Okay, as you can see, my pattern palette over here is an absolute mess because I really do like patterns. I play with patterns a lot. But for this example, we're going to first create, we're going to create two patterns. We're going to create a simple offset pattern, and then we're going to create a seamless pattern. And I hope under, everyone understands what I mean by that. An offset pattern is just a simple repeating pattern. So we'll make sure the width and height is the same for demonstration. I'm going to turn off. Your painting. I got to zoom out a little bit so I can see where the edge is. Pardon me. Oh. Do you have unlimited undos set, or what do you recommend for that in Painter? I, I, I do have unlimited undos set. I also have a computer that I'm pretty much could cut DNA. It's very strong. Uh, so. If you don't, you can change it in the preferences, preferences, performance, uh, unless they moved it. Did you move it? Memory usage, multi-core, scratch, undo yeah. levels right here. I have, nope, I, I take that back. I have 32. Really, why would you want to undo more than 32 times? See, I thought I had unlimited undos. <laughs> but, yeah, 32, I have it set to 32, which I, I never have the problem that I need to undo more than that probably because I save versions. All right, so now I'm going to pick, let's see, what should we, color should we do the pattern on top? Let's do like a, first let's match. I'm going to do a flat pattern, so I'm going to match this color. I'm picking up that color right there with my 
color sample tool, dropper, same as Photoshop. I'm going to take my paint bucket. I'm going to make sure this is set to current color. I can see it right there. Uh, that's a little bright. Okay, and that's on the canvas. Now I'm going to pick a new layer, and I'm going to go back to mirror mode, but this time I'm going to go into kaleidoscope mode. That kaleidoscope is a lot like um, those old spirograph tools that we used to play with as kids. It's probably better just demoed, but I'm going to increase the segments to six. And now I'm going to pick a wash brush. The wet, wet wash brush will work fine for what I'm doing. Pick a darker blue. And I, again, I ha I'm pretty sure this is the default settings for the wash brush. I tend not to mess around with it. And then we're going to make a pretty little flower. Make it a little white. I love that. I've never tried making a flower with kaleidoscope this way. Oh, I, I'm a flower addict. I make so many flowers. It's ridiculous. Uh, we'll do a little... Okay, so there, I mean, you probably, everyone out there is probably like, I could make a better flower than that, and you probably could. Uh, but for this demo purposes, you don't need to watch me make flowers all day, because believe me, I will start to forget you're all there, and I will make flowers for like 20 minutes. So now we're done with our pretty little flower, so we can turn off the kaleidoscope tool. And I'm going to hit select all. That step is important because you need to tell Painter the boundaries of your pattern. Now, I don't have to hit select all. I could make a square around this uh, if I, because it's going to pick up everything that's in this pattern. I'm actually going to drop this down. One thing that you have to remember with patterns is you can only create a pattern from one layer. If I wanted to create a mass pattern, which I'll do in the next step, I would keep that flower on its separate layer because if I undo that, you'll notice just like in Photoshop, this flower has transparency behind it. It does not have any paint behind it. So I'm going to drop it down because we're creating a flat pattern in this step. And I'm going to hit select all because I actually do want all this blue space as part of my pattern. And then down here, can you see all of my screen? There's a, let me try to move this up because I don't know if you can see all my screen. But there's a Capture Pattern button, this little white button right here. So I hit that. I'm going to name it um, Yet Another Flower Pattern, because I have a lot. I'm going to select the Horizontal Shift. Now this is what creates a half drop. I'm going to move that to 50%. If I wanted a, it in thirds, I would hit thirds. Now you can see what this does. I know in, in Photoshop you go you use the offset filter and you have to have your document and do a lot of math and it used to be so confusing to me. And But this is simple because you can see it. I might not want 50%. I might want a pattern that has 60 or 70%. So this has a lot of control over your pattern. I'm going to hit OK. And now my pattern will appear well, it's up here, but I really don't want it here because, as you can see, I have a lot of patterns. So I'm going to drag it down here. There it is, yet another flower pattern. So as you can see, I have a green line around it. That's what tells me that pattern is selected. So I'm going to go back to my um, canvas just so I can show you what the pattern does. I'm going to pick the fill. Now, Painter will automatically, def now, as soon as you're done making a pattern, it's sort of smarter than we are. It goes to source image, but you do need to be on source image to make your pattern. And I'm just going to click in here, and it's going to fill. Now, you'll notice it's huge, because I created a really big pattern so you guys could see it. But with Painter's patterns, you have dynamic control. When I say dynamic, because you can change it on the fly, control over the scale of your pattern. I can also change the uh, how much it offsets up here. Now, you might be saying, who cares? This is important because when I used to use Photoshop for patterns, I used to create patterns at all different sizes or have to scale them up. But now I can do it on the fly, which is really, really important when you're creating patterns. I might want it huge. If I go back to making it a little bit bigger, 
uh, 117 you probably won't be able to see, but 73%, now that pattern is big again. But we're going to use it small for our dress and put it back down to 10. I'm just going to save this so I know where it is. So I might use it later. Okay, so where should we put our pattern? Um, we have a new layer. I don't want it. Do I want it set to gel? Maybe. We'll see how it looks. Uh, gel is a lot like multiply. For those of you who are not familiar, you can use multiply too. I like gel. It gives like a, a little bit of a darker feel. So I'm using my selection tool right now and I'm making a very rough selection. I, I actually don't want the whole blue selected because I want it to look like sort of collaged together. Um, again, its roughness is probably I think a little bit more of its going to be its charm. And I'm going to fill this with my um, blue pattern. So now I have a little bit uh, turn the selection off. Now I have a little bit more visual interest to my dress, but it's still not enough. I still want to add um, something a little bit more. You can also create a seamless pattern in Painter. And what I mean by seamless is if you've ever created a pattern where you have to match up the edges, it's actually can be very tedious to do in either Photoshop or Illustrator, but Painter makes it very easy. So I'm going to show you the pattern that we're going to make for something simpler. While you're opening that, I have a question from Andy, and he's saying that he noticed that you saved in the Photoshop format, and he's wondering what your reasoning is. Do you bring it back into Photoshop, or is that just your preference? I do bring it back into Photoshop. Everything ends up in Photoshop in the end. Um, I'm sort of, sort of a color management Nazi, too, and I... Uh, test for autogamic colors. Uh, everything I do ends up getting printed. If you weren't going to get it printed, I don't know why you would need to be in the Photoshop, uh, native Photoshop format. But because I'm going back and forth, I also use uh, Adobe Bridge a lot. And if I don't save it as a PSD, I can't see the icon. So as you can see, this one is not uh, Folk Art Flowers is a riff. And I don't, I don't know what it looks like. So I'm, if you look at my desktop, you can see how disorganized I am. I need to be able to see a, um, a little thumbnail of what I'm creating. So that's why I save it in the PSD format. OK. So this right here, let me first show you what it, it does. Uh, we'll make it a little bit bigger. To the left, I have a seamless pattern created. Let me see if I can find it. Here it is. Just to show you an example of this seamless pattern. Ooh, that's a little small. Let's go back up to around 100%. OK, now as you can see, it's seamless. All the seams match up. This would be very difficult to do in any other program. Um, I'm going to show you the steps that I did. It's actually just one or two steps. So we're going to, again, create a new document, and we'll create it at about 5 by 5. Can patterns have transparency? Yes. They can have uh, either 100% transparency. I'm going to show you that mass patterns. Hold on to that question. OK. I'm going to show right. you that next. They can't have partial transparency, but they can have um, somewhat transparency. That is the next step. All right, so I'm going to pick a, a new pink. Oh, I don't want that. I want current color. OK. And I'm actually going to draw directly on the canvas for this. Uh, I will pick my pen tool, which is right here. I like the Croquille pen. Again, and I'm using it pretty much. Actually, I think the default is not bleed at zero. I put the bleed down to zero. And I'm going to explain brush stuff in the second half. So hold on to your brush questions, because I know this part is probably a little bit confusing. So in the pattern library, in the pattern, the, the pattern panel, I'm sorry, there is an option called define pattern. Now this is going to get a little bit confusing because I don't know why. If Tanya, if I could make a request to rename this because define pattern really is not what it does. It's really a magic wrapping tool. I think it should be called um, 
rap pattern or rapalicious or raparama, something along the lines. <laughs> okay, good um, suggestion. I'll bring it back. <laughs> you know, to find patterns is really not, and plus it's confusing. A, a mnemonic device that I use to remember is capture pattern um, is when you want to actually create the pattern. So that's the end of the process. You create the pattern. Remember the C's, capture, create. Define pattern is the magic wrapping tool. So I have to zoom out a little bit so I can see what I'm doing. I'll pick a darker pink color and make my brush a little bit bigger. And let's draw a little flower. I really like flowers. I know the men in the audience are probably like, oh, I don't have the fine pattern on. Fine pattern. Okay. Now, as you can see, as I draw, it is wrapping to the other side. And I'm not going to have you guys watch me draw flowers all day, even though that's really, if I had my choice, I would just draw flowers all day. But this is more intuitive to me than making a pattern and then trying to seamlessly uh, sort of match it up. Because it's, especially with patterns, like I tend to like organic patterns. I don't like really rigid patterns. So, yeah, this to me is just a little bit more organic. So I hope everyone can see that. It's Every time I draw, it wraps to the side automatically. And this is kind of ugly, so I'm going to use this one instead as an example because I obviously spent more time on this. So we're done with it. We're going to hit Select All. It's the same process again. I'm going to hit Capture Pattern. Actually, I'm going to make sure I'm in my flowers. Um, I'm going to name it yet another flower pink. This time, I don't want any vertical or horizontal shift, because uh, the shift I already have accounted for. And it's going to create it right there. And now if I open up a new document. I'm so happy you're showing this. I don't think that we've ever had any sort of tutorial on the patterns. It's and really it is. a neat feature. Perfectly wrapping. Now, where would you use this, you might be asking. I have no desire to draw dresses. Um, so I need to show you a qu few quick examples of, actually, before I do that, let me show you the pattern brush. And then we'll go to examples of how you could use this. Because I know some of you probably work more painterly, and you're thinking, I'll never use this. But trust me, you will. You will definitely use this. Now we're going to go over to pattern brushes, which I love. Okay, anytime you create a pattern, it, begin, it can be loaded into your brush. Now, I know in Photoshop, you can also paint with objects as sort of like stamps, but it's different in Painter because you can use multiple colors. This is a pattern brush. This, I'm going to switch to pattern pen first is a pattern brush. I swear I will use this eventually. I don't know if you can see what that is. It's little skeletons in a dance of death. And I did it at a, a really small size. But I swear, I, I put it in my last children's book and it got deleted out because my editor thought it was absolutely too morbid. But I'm going to use it eventually. So if you're working more painterly, you could create, say you want to create a forest really quickly. I don't know. You could create all these different little brushes. I have all these vine brushes. Oh, that's a mask one. Oh, that's a mask one. Okay. So now I'm going to go over how to create masked brushes. Now masked brushes are the brushes that actually have transparency in them. And to explain what I mean by that, I have to fill my canvas. but not with a pattern, fill it with a color, and a new layer. And as you can see, there's complete transparency behind it. Um, so you can put this on top of things. So let's real quickly make a simple pattern brush. There are a few rules that you need to know, understand with patterns. I need to turn my rulers on so I can make something. Okay, first off, patterns have to go left to right. 
You can't create them up and down, or unless you want a whole row up and down. Let me fill this back with white. And guess what I'm going to make? I'm going to make another flower, because I don't think we've had enough flowers today. Wash brush. Or maybe I'll do something a little bit more painterly. It's weird. I don't know if it's because it's getting my screen, but um, my brush is having a little bit of a, a lag time. Is that normal, Tanya? It probably has to do with GoToMeeting, and it's just taking a lot of processor power. Yeah, because I, this usually, I usually can, I have to paint a lot slower. I could see this might be problematic in the next demo, but okay. We'll just create something really simple. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to pop them into the question panel for us. Okay, so we created a, a simple little leaf brush. I've had to do it really rough because I'm experiencing, for some strange reason, I'm experiencing like a little bit of a lag time in my uh, brush as I paint. I don't know why, but that normally wouldn't be the case. Deb is asking, I know you just pulled that the ruler out, and it's just a guide, correct? Yeah, it's just a guide. It won't be part of it. Okay, so the same rules apply for creating the pattern brush. I'm going to create a, a masked pattern brush because I don't want this white background as part of my brush this time. So I need to remember to create it on its own layer. And again, you can only use one layer. So if you draw in multiple layers, you'll need to collapse everything down. It's grayed out because I don't have multiple layers. You'll need to select collapse layer and shift click on all your layers. So I'm taking my selection tool and I want it actually pretty close from left to right. I'm going to pick a lot of space from the top to the bottom, and the reason why I'm going to do that is because when you use the pattern mask brush tool, it will feather all this area up here, so I need some space from top to bottom. And then, same rules apply, I just want to make sure it's going into the right place. I'm going to hit capture pattern, and you'll get this scary window and you'll think you've done something wrong because it's black, and the reason why it's black is because that's showing you all the areas that's transparent. We'll call this green vine. I'm going to go back to my pattern brush. This time though, I'm going to create select pattern pen mast. And if I paint on my next layer, you can see it's creating a brush. That's following the, the direction of my pen. So, um, but you have to have that selection correct around there. If I had like ugly gaps, I wouldn't get that, you know, that vine around it. So I'm happy with that. We'll name it Brain. And then we'll add a few details. The reason why this is nice is because just like take this, this is just a little bit a by um, an oval shape. And let me make it a little smaller. It gives a painterly feel to your brushes because remember, your brushes can have all sorts of texture. That's a little too big. Your brushes can have all sorts of texture now into them, and they can have multiple colors. Now, one more thing about patterns. Anytime you have a pattern and you want to um, adjust it, let's let me actually pick one that has color in it. How long have you been using the, the capture pattern and the pattern pens and all that? They've been in Painter for quite a while. Yeah, they've been in Painter for quite a while, but they used to be the, the pattern mover. And I was, it's funny because in my book, I, wrote for, I first wrote it for Painter 11, and explaining the pattern chapter took two pages. And now, and when I rewrote it for Painter 12, it literally was three steps, like capture pattern. Make sure you have your selection there, and there you go. It's just there. So anytime you have um, a pattern, you can check out the pattern. Now let's say I like this pattern, but I want to change the color of it. I can say adjust colors, make it purple, 
and now go back to here, capture pattern again. I didn't, you don't have to hit select all. I like to because I like to tell Painter where I want my pattern, but you don't have to. It's the same process again. I would name this yet another flower, purple, and it would go into my library and then, yeah, yeah, <laughs> see? Um, it would go into my library. So organizing your libraries real quickly. You can, if you want to share, you can export your, any of your pattern libraries. If I wanted to, in case anyone did not get enough flowers today, you can email me and I will, oh, I don't want that. I will export my pattern library out. I will save it somewhere and then I will send it to you. And you can import it in by hitting import pattern libraries, finding where you saved it on your hard drive and then you too can have this many flowers. You can also create a new empty set. Let's say I want to organize this with, um, I don't know, skeletons, because I want to make more skeleton patterns. Yeah, there's a little bit of a lag time, it's weird. So now I can take this skeleton and I can drag it down. It needs to have something selected before. I didn't get it. Drag it down. And now I can also delete with a little trash can. And you can create all sorts of tons and tons of pattern libraries. Um, I like lace patterns. In fact, I think I might use that in this little dress. I might put a little bit of the lace. Not that one, this one. And make it a little bit bigger. And then I would change the color to something. Oh, I have that on the same layer, so it's changing that layer too. But you get the idea. And all that pattern is, that lace pattern, is this. I just scanned in a piece of lace, um, had it on its own layer, select all, because that's about as much space as I want and captured pattern and now I have lace. So you can scan in all sorts of things. Um, let me show you another quick example. Sometimes you can um, you can create I need to make it a little bit bigger so you can see it. But you can create uh, this is butterflies. So you know, add a group of butterflies and make your own butterfly pattern. I don't know where you would use that. I haven't used that yet, but, oh, plaid. I actually use plaids a lot. You could create, let me show you what that fills as. Uh, I love plaid. I'm on, sort of on my plaid kick now. But this fills as, no, that's stripes. I'm in the stripes area. Plaid. Where's plaid? There's my plaid. Painter comes with plaid patterns, but you can use any of those patterns as brushes. Let's say you wanted to make a, I don't know, a um, dress which you wanted to make your character to have a little plaid trim. You can make it paint along there. Now this is great for fabric too because you can make it go with the fold of your fabric. And this is where I'll show you examples of some of the ways I've used patterns. Emma is wondering if you ever use a warp filter to drape a pattern across fabric folds. I used to, and then I figured out that this was a far more easier and better way to do it, and it looked a lot more natural than the war. I used to do this long, compl complicated process where I'd use the displaced filter. This is a displaced filter in Painter, too. It does the same thing. A displaced filter in Photoshop, and I would make a grayscale image, and then I would create a fabric drape, and then uh, displace it to the gray and black and white image, and it was really tedious, and it, honestly, it didn't really look like patterns. But here's an example right here. Here's the lace brush. And all I did was take the lace and just drew it in. Drew it in. This is a lot easier than taking um, a lace brush and having to warp it to your figure. Uh, the, the warp tool, it's, it's a great tool. I still use it for some things. But this to me looks far more natural to actually drape it over the, the direction of your pen than to use the warp tool. And you can see a pattern right there too. Uh, this is from Who Put the Bee in the Ballyhoo. Uh, it's a children's book on the circus. That's the bearded lady. Her name is Annie Jones. Everyone says she looks like me. I think she kind of does too, except for my beard isn't as long. 
This is a, a astrology cards I'm working on. Uh, this right here, this is a scanned vintage pattern. This is another lace pattern in a little, uh, these are kind of blurry because they're in 72 DPI, but that trim right there, that's a pattern. And just a word, caution about copyright. I see a lot of people using patterns in their art. Remember, anytime you use a pattern and it's uh, not as old as 1920, I believe, you stand in, um, you know, I don't, there's that argument about um, how much of the work is derivative. Really, you cannot use a pattern in your artwork if it's after 1920. You can't just stand in a pattern and use it. That's copyright, that's plagiarism, and there are people who create fabrics for a living, and you can't do that. So if you're using it for commercial work, then I say just create your own patterns. They're going to be far better than some, uh, somebody else's patterns. This is just an example of a blatant overuse of patterns. This is a pattern brush right here. This is all pattern. That's a pattern brush. That's a pattern fill. Oops. <laughs> um, pattern, pattern, pattern. I'm sort of getting into Persian art now. And the trim along there is a pattern brush. It's so great. That's what I have as our Facebook cover image right now. Yeah, I saw that. Thanks for putting that up. Uh, this is a pattern right here. It's just a simple offset pattern. These flowers are a pattern brush. Henry VIII is full of patterns on his trim on his jacket. That was created with a pattern brush. Um, and his um, the background right here is created with a pattern. I just finished a book on Louisa May Alcott. Oh, that, this book, by the way, is for the Ruckus Royals. Uh, this book is Louisa May Alcott. It's out in 2013. And I had to, she's wearing this plaid dress in about six spreads. And there was no way I was going to paint plaid over and over again. So I used the pattern brush for her plaid of her dress. Is, patterns used. I'm sorry. Is all of your work digital or do you do any traditional work for your books? Uh, it's all digital, yeah. Okay. Uh, lots of pattern in here. Uh, I use patterns a lot to do sort of digital collage. The circles are a simple pattern which is offset just like I showed you. And this pattern is the pattern I showed you earlier, how I created it seamlessly. There this, are a lot of questions coming in about how you do the drapery and the folds that they're seeing in these various pieces of artwork here. OK, um, I will try to demo that. The only thing I'm worried about is I'm getting a bit of a lag in my brush. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to, well, let me show you real quick. Well, you, uh, you don't have to worry about. Um, if you can't fit it in, that's okay, too. Okay, because I want to leave time for, what time is it now? I want to leave time for oil painting, too, um, for those of you who don't want to use patterns at all. But I love patterns. I think it adds, if you look at Matisse's work, I mean, he's someone who played with patterns brilliantly. But you can also use patterns just to simplify your work process. This, I, I showed you guys the Briar pattern brush earlier. All of this was created with that. Um, I created about four different branch brushes. And then it, I quickly painted in around the circle with all my four different branch brushes. Now, I don't know how long this would have taken me if I had to draw this by hand. But it probably wouldn't have been as natural looking. And it would have been really tedious and boring to do. So um, you can use patterns just to simplify a process. Uh, this is, again, I love plaid. Uh, this was the plaid pattern brush. And this is an example of a more complicated pattern. Um, I don't know where I'm going to use this, but I might. It's a damask, but it's in, in the shape of a peacock. I need to color it in, too. But here's an example of uh, you want to, when you create a pattern, you'll often have to do it in stages. So you'd want to check it out. Uh, I use the mirror painting mode across uh, down the, the side to create all this. And then to make it to blend seamlessly, at that point, I turned on define pattern. So is a way of combining different pattern options. That would make a nice wallpaper. Yeah, I'm a, I'll <laughs> use it for something. I don't know what. Maybe I'll put it on somebody's dress. And here are the dresses that I've created so far. Um, now, you, you saw how quickly that took me. I'm, I'm redecorating, and I'm uh, doing my daughter's walls. So I'm going to put up all these little dresses along her wall, and it will be fun. So, so cute. cute. All right, so now we're going to move on to something a little bit more serious, serious painting. And I hope I'm not going to get the same lag in my brush. Um, 
We're going to paint with the sergeant brush. And just to show you quickly what we're going to be creating. And I'm going to have to do this really quickly because, uh, yeah, we're getting down there on time. OK, I love sergeant's work. Sergeant is brilliant. Let me just get to my notes here. Um, the way he painted, I mean, there's a reason why there's a brush named after him. If you go into your artist brush category, I have it saved over here. If you go into your artist brush category, you will see the sergeant brush. This brush is used by a lot of people because it's, it's a very sculptural brush. Let me just show you quickly how it paints. It paints sort of like how the way a sculptor would define paint with this really, really smeary paint. Um, I have my jitter set up. That's where I'm getting the, those little textural stuff at the end. So we're going to start from start to finish. We first start with a sketch. And I have this in steps so we can skip through so you don't have to watch me paint. Oh, first I'm going to open up Sergeant's Madam X because we need that for inspiration. All right, color palette. So Sergeant, uh, let me put this on its own separate layer. I'm going to cut it and paste it and set it to gel so I can see it over my canvas. Sergeant used a very limited color palette. Uh, you can see an example. This is his actual color palette, which I was surprised to find, but it's kind of cool to look at. Uh, someone saved his color palette and took a picture of it. Isn't that cool? So he used a lot of, uh, see, like, it looks like a little bit of Mars brown in here, um, sepia tones, uh, lead white, a little black. Uh, but his, you can see from his palette, it's pretty limited. So the way he would start a canvas is he would start with almost uh, like a grayish green tone. And this isn't something that Sargent did. This is something that you know old masters have been doing since. Well, we don't want to start with flat, though. We want to start with our current color. OK. So the reason why I start with a green color is because, especially when painting skin, I'm going to go actually a little bit lower than that, a little bit lighter than that in value. I always start, uh, when I'm painting Caucasian skin, I always start with a green color. And the reason why I do that is because when light hits your skin, um, it actually bounces, the way light hits your skin, it bounces off and it will absorb the red, which is from your blood, and it will reflect the opposite back, which is green. Green is also a color that is um, in between warm and cool. And what I mean by that is reds have a very long wavelength, so they are warm. They'll come forward, vibrate forward. And blues and violets have a short wavelength. They are cool. Green is actually can, is one of those weird colors that can be in the middle. It can be both cool and warm. And so the painting technique that I use is Rodaccio, and it isn't anything new. Like the old masters have been doing this since the dawn of time. But I always start every painting, I shouldn't say always, if I if I want a contrast between warm and cool, and I need transparent looking skin, I will start with this green color. So there's my canvas base. And then I'm going to pick up my sergeant tool. And this is pretty much the default settings for the sergeant tool. But I do sometimes play with my jitter a little bit. And jitter will do what I showed you earlier. I make my brush a little bit bigger. If I put my jitter down. Actually, I'm going to fill this so you can see the color. If I paint without any jitter, it goes on very smoothly. If I increase the jitter, let's increase it a lot so you can see it, it does this thing where it's like the paint actually sort of, it feels like the paint is going on rough. For the initial first wash of color, I'm going to keep the jitter down. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to mix up my color palette. So let me clear. This is the mixer pad for those of you who aren't as familiar with Painter. You can, anytime you see a painting, if I open up my color set, you can see my color set library is right down here. These are the flesh tones that I usually use. And this is my first tone value painting that I create in Verdaccio. You can, if you're so inclined, say new color set from layer. Now this will create 
an entire color set based on Sargent's painting. But you have to remember, this is a photo of Sargent's painting. So you can do this to get the initial idea, but he didn't really use this color. He used more of this color, not this color. And it's because I'm, cre I'm selecting from a photo. So unless you have a really, really good photo of the painting, I wouldn't go by this to get your color palette. Um, it's great to steal, you know, say you see, like, sometimes I'll, I'll walk in a store and I'll, I'll see, like, I don't know, a piece of fabric, and it has like three or four colors in it, and I just like the way the artist has combined the blue and the darks, and I will um, do scan it in, use new color set from that to get an idea of where that balance is coming from. But this isn't going to be helpful for us. So I'm going to take out my mixer pad, and I always do value strings first. I turn on dirty mode. I have apply color. And from my color sets, I'm going to create a value string. And I think anyone who's painted traditionally understands what I mean by value string. You just do a, take a color and uh, lower the chroma to it from dark to light. And then to mix those colors together, I got my mixer brush, and I'm just blending. Blend, 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 blend. And then I also want a little bit of a cool tone in here. So again, I'm going to go back to this. I'm going to create uh, your preference for value strings. Some people do like, I don't know, five strings of color. Uh, I think that's plenty. It's probably a little too violet, but it'll work. And then I'll mix those together too. And then I want also some a little bit of flesh colors for this painting. So I'll create a fine with it blending into the blue because there are times when I want a lower saturated flesh color with a little bit of blue in it. And again, use the mixer. So that's pretty much, I mean, of course, this is my mixer palette for this painting. It might be completely different for another painting. But that's about what the colors I want to start with. So then I take my Sargent brush, and I have it over here in my um, palette saved. Anytime you want to save a brush, all you do is grab it, pull it out. I don't want white, though. And with the Sargent brush, you have to remember, um, you need to paint with color on color. If I create a new layer and paint, nothing will show up. There has to be some color behind it. So as I paint, I both sample from here, and I use the value wheel right here. Sample color right is right here. So I actually want a little bit of a redder color than that. And I will just start to block in color. Now the reason why I like this tool for the initial stage of color is it works sort of, it works in a very sculptural way. Um, I, I don't really, I mean I'm using my lines as a guide, but I really want my painting to take form kind of like the way um, an artist would extrude, you know, clay from a block. I'm just trying to establish those initial really uh, flat planes of color. And I don't work in strict verdaccio. I use a little bit of color mixed in, but for the most part, I'm just trying to get my values right at this point. So if I zoom in on here. Do you ever use the temporal color palette, or do you prefer to set them up like you have here? Yeah, I like to, I'm a bit of a control freak. Um, I could see how that would be. I've seen some people, you know, use color wheels and stuff, and color is sort of, uh, I view as kind of an innate thing where you have to, I think if you start to be too formulaic with color, you'll lose the emotion of your painting. It should be something like when you are painting and you feel that, something needs to be a little cooler. I think it's something that you will do innately. You'll automatically reach for that cooler color. And if you start to be too strict about it, about, you know, thinking too much about it, I think it's, it's sort of, it's going to strip the emotion out of your painting. So I don't want to have, um, for time's sake, we're going to skip forth to the next step. So this is my color blocks stage. And this is what my painting would look at initial just, you know, you can see it's very rough. Again, it looks like something my two-year-old daughter would do. Um, but just roughly blocking in color just to get the actual form. Then after I get the actual form, I'm going to move on to some of my, um, the brushes that 
you can use sort of more in a wash sense. I'll use this as a base. So my next brush, I like the real flat, and I also like the fine feathering oil brush. You can see the brush up there. But I do adjust it somewhat. First off is feature. Feature is really important. Feature is what gives your bristles. Uh, it controls actually the, um, let me put the lead down so you can see it. It controls the space in between your bristles. So if you like a really bristly brush, you'll want to keep the feature fairly high. And you can see with it set at 5.7, that's a pretty bristly brush. If I turn it all the way down, you're not getting as much of that bristly look. Um, I tend not to, I rarely ever have my feature go below 1.5 because to me that looks, this brush right here looks very digital. This is how I would paint naturally. But to get that, there is another thing that I had to adjust to. Um, let me find it. Okay, if there's one thing to remember in this, I know when you watch these webinars, you really only end up picking up like two or three things. Uh, if there's two things to remember about brushes. The most important are impasto and color variability. The reason why color variability is important is this slider will actually uh, make my brush, if I put this back to its default settings and paint on something like orange, this color is going on very flat. But that's not really how brushes work in real life. In traditional painting, think about the way you're painting. You pick up brushes, your palette's messy, uh, you're picking, you're dabbing paint here and here. Your brush is never really loaded with one true color. So if you mess with the hue, saturation, and value, you can see that, oops, let me show you the difference. All right, so this is, I got green selected, so you're not going to see it. This is my brush. Can you see all, despite the fact that I've picked a very ugly mustard yellow color, can you see that this has all this striations, striation, is that the word? Well, you know what I mean. Um, and that's really more how paint goes on. I mean, I've set that pretty high. I would probably turn the hue down to one, keep the saturation at maybe four, and the value. Value is the most important. I always have the value the highest. Increase the feature a little bit. That's a nice brush. I'm happy with that. Okay, next thing is bleed. Bleed is really important. Bleed will actually, everyone asks you, use blender brushes. I do use blender brushes when I work with pastels. I don't use them with oils um, for the same reason that I never, when I painted traditionally, I always blended with brushes. I never would like use my finger or anything to smear. Uh, if you're like a finger smearer painter, then you might like the blender brush. But really, every brush has the possibility to blend. It's all you have to do is control how much that bleed is in here. Now, if you can see, if I increase it, this is the equivalent of loading your brush with, say, a lot of linseed oil. Um, if I keep holding my brush down, holding it down and not letting out, it's just blending, 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 blending like crazy. And then when I lift it back up, if I put my bleed back down and change another color, I can paint on top of that in glazes. Again, bleed back up if I'm in blend mode. If I lift my brush up, it'll blend just a little. If I keep it down, it's going to keep blending and blending. So this to me is more like traditional painting because think about the way you paint with linseed oil. Um, when you're using a little bit of medium, you can use a little or a lot. So I've, I've seen blend described many different ways, but I would describe it, think of it more as medium in your paint. If you're the type of person that you paint with a lot of medium or you like glazes, you're probably going to want to keep that bleed pretty high, not, not at 100%. But when you're painting at glazes, I typically have it about 40%. About Okay, so how would this translate to our, oh, I forgot impasto, oh, and this was my nagging thing to remember. Okay, next thing to remember, every single brush when I'm getting down to the final stages, I always add depth to my paint. Again, if there's one thing to remember, it's your paint, your brush should always have depth. And you can see the depth, I'll increase the depth even more right here so you can see it. That's a little too high. That's a little crazy. Let's not go that crazy. 
but you can see that that paint is applying with, uh, with you know, bristling marks. Now, why is this important? Well, I was thinking about why I hated, I call it the digital goo, where you look at a painting and it looks like all smooth and blended, like you know it's trying to be painterly, but it just looks so blended and smooth. And I call it the digital goo. And I thought, why did I, why do I hate digital goo so much? Because it's, it's, art's very subjective. And I was in a gallery one day and I was looking at, I think it was a Boldini painting. And when you look at a painting in person, you can see the weight of the paint. You can see where the artist has raised the paint, where they have applied more paint and where they've applied less paint. Now this is very important if you're printing out your work because in, if you're trying to paint traditionally, if you're doing like fembots and manga work and all that, you can go ahead and make your digital go. But if you're painting in a very painterly way, your paint has to have weight to it if you want it to have that, that feel of traditional paint. And it's, it's really the difference between going from 2D to 3D art. It's just giving that, that little something extra. Um, Okay, so on to the next I question. was just going to ask you at the end um, if you happen to have any tutorials for fabric folds or anything I can guide people to. Yes, um, there is actually a tutorial in the book on how to, um, let me think, where it is. Well, that's perfect. Good to know. If it's in your book, then we can just let everyone know where to find your book. Uh, this tutorial right this uh, is a sergeant tutorial, and in it I show you how to, uh, I created that pattern over the chair, and um, the pattern on her fan, and the pattern on her mask. And I did use, um, I think I used warp on the mask, only because I hadn't discovered the pattern brush at that point. You can use warp. I mean, it'll get the job done, but it just doesn't feel as naturalistic. And this is a pattern that I created in, it was either Photoshop or Painter. I can't remember, but that, that tutorial is in the book. And my escape key does not work. Oop, spinning beach ball. Okay, mm -hmm. no. Okay, back to painter. So, the, all right, again, just to be a nag, repeat those three things. Color variability, impasto, and what was the third thing I said? There was a third thing. Oh, bleed, bleed. Bleed's very important. The next thing that is important with oil paintings is resaturation. Um, you can do resaturation in any painting. It will be in the well option right here. But if you don't see it in the property bar, it probably isn't going to affect the brush that much. Any so anything time you see things in the property bar, that means that pay attention to that because that's a big part of that brush. So this is my fine feathering oil. And this is another brush that I love because it has resaturation to it. And it also is picking up the grain of my canvas. I have, if I switch to it, let's say a crackle texture, let me pick a darker color so you can see that. And that is where I got all the, um, I don't know if you can see it, if it's high enough resolution, but if you can look in there, I put a little crackle here and there. I like crackle. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers when, um, the crackle textures all come with painter, by the way. I think you can find them in their resource area. I didn't make those papers. So I don't know if anyone remembers crackle medium, but it smells really bad, and I'm sure it kills brain cells, so you don't need to use crackle medium on your painting anymore. You can use um, any of the hard media brushes, or anytime you see grain, um, you can use get this sort of crackle effect with this crackle paper. So I like the fine feathering oils because it also has resaturation in it. And I'm going to go back to a regular paper so you can see this a little bit better. Move over here. And put another color next to it. So resaturation is kind of like how much uh, your paint loads. And you can basically, do you see I'm not having any paint? That's sort of, I would equate that to dipping your brush into turpentine or linseed oil and spreading the paint. That's basically what lowering your resaturation does. So anytime you need to paint that way, um, if I put resaturation back up and pick a different color so you can see it, that's basically saying to painter, okay, I want my paintbrush loaded with paint right now. Okay, so we're going to skip ahead to the next step of oil painting. Does the crackle, that's not just a Painter 12 pattern, is it? 
Well, it's been in Painter forever. I think yeah. it's like Painter yeah. 5, 6. There's always been crackle textures. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of patterns that already come with, I mean, papers that already come with Painter. This is the stage where I would, oh, where, again, you'll notice I'm, it's still sort of a value painting. There's a little bit of color. I do work color into her hair. Um, the reason why I do that is because I do hair first because the hair will actually change the color of the skin tone. It's very important for your characters, even if you're doing like sci-fi fantasy and they're blue hair, if you have a figure with blue hair, that's going to affect the skin tone because light reflects onto light and your skin is uh, through subsurface scattering. I, I discuss all this in the book, by the way, if this is kind of over your head. Subsurface scattering, all the neighboring colors around your object is going to hit that object and but bounce light off that. So always, uh, tip is to always paint the hair first. Um, so this is what it would look like after I use both the flat oil brush and the fine feathering brush at that settings that I showed you. And then I start to smooth things out even more. And again, you can see there's really no color in it. She still is uh, pretty much a value painting. And then I start to build out a little bit more color. And you can see at this point, I start to add a little bit of blue. I always add a little bit more blue around the chin, especially in men, and around the eyes because the skin is thinner there. Um, and anywhere where there's shadow, I'll start to add a little bit more of this blue. And then as I work up more, this is an example of the canvas texture that I showed you. I'll, it's funny because when you work in digital painting, um, it's sort of different from traditional because the texture becomes sort of a neat part of the process. But sometimes you do have to add the texture back in at the end. And this is an up close where you can see the hair where I've added a little bit more texture in. And then we'll, we'll skip to the final painting. That's not the final painting. Let's find the final painting. Is that? Maybe it is. Okay. I'm actually not done with this. I'm still working with No, that's not the final painting. Let's close those out. Here's the final painting over here. Okay, so are you, you're never really done with a painting, are you? Um, I'll still probably work this up a little more. I see her, her hands are a little too red. I kind of like the redness around her nose because it looks like she's been crying. But I, if there's another piece of advice I could give, it's to always get your values right first. If you get those values right, then you've, you've accomplished 99% of your painting. Um, add, add your color in slowly. Um, too much color all at once, your values can get thrown off. Uh, remember that green for the mint tones. It's a wonderful way to get very translucent looking skin. Uh, last tip is to study the masters. It's a great idea to try to replicate an old master's painting, even if you want to create it exactly the way it was. Um, of course, you wouldn't put it in your portfolio, but it's a good exercise to try to learn from the masters. And I would just like to answer the questions. People were, they're inquiring about your book. Where do they find it? Does it cover oh, yeah. Painter yeah. and Photoshop? Okay. Uh, it covers both Painter and Photoshop. Um, I'll show you really quickly some of the tutorials that are in it and what is covered in each one. Okay, this is a tutorial on how to create motion in, in your brush. and. Uh, about depth of field in edge painting. Edge painting is really important, and I think anyone with traditional background will understand what I mean. But it's something Sargent was like a master of, and I still struggle with it because it's very hard to do correctly. But this is a chapter on creating the right edges. If you notice, the edge of here and the edge of here are sort of uh, this more atmospheric perspective, while the edge of here is very sharp. And that's why I love the Sargent brush, because one of the mistakes that I see in art is there's, there's too much feathering in the brush. And what happens with that is you, you, you lose your light source when you don't have enough sharp edges. There has to be a sharp edge and also a receding edge. So understanding edge painting is really important. I recommend reading the Riley papers. Riley wrote a lot about artists painting into the edge. So this is a chapter all about that. The book is more on painting. If you are a traditional painter, you're probably going to pick up some tips even if you don't paint to do, uh, digitally. So this is obviously created in Painter. Um, I could never get 
the look of this in Photoshop. Uh, this was created in Painter also. Um, I talk about painting hair and painting patterns and using the sergeant brush and glazes. Uh, this is a, a chapter on impasto effects. It looks really blurry here. It's a lot sharper um, when printed out. But this is a chapter all on how to get depth in your paint. Um, this is a chapter on getting those bristly brush marks, like um, just feeling like there's still the brush stroke in the paint. This is from the Ruckus Royals, but it's also a tutorial in the book. And you can say this crackle. I just love crackle. Love cracking me. A watercolor, it's not my strength. Um, I'm not a watercolorist. I recommend uh, watching Skip Allen's tutorial if you're really into watercolors. I do have a chapter on creating a watercolor painting from start to finish, but again, it's not my strength. Um, this is a chapter on the pen and ink and getting more expressive line work. And this is a chapter on photo montages. Um, this is my daughter. Uh, she wasn't in this flower field or holding keys, but uh, she is in the final painting. And this is a chapter on pastel and getting your colors right. And this is a chapter on kaleidoscope. So that's it.